we have already learned some 50 important questions from building materials namely cement and brick in the previous two videos now in this video we are going to learn 25 important questions from the building material still now let's get into it the first question is the first question is which one of the following is not an ore of iron so in order to get iron that is chemically denoted by fe we have some ores so which one of the following options uh, is not an ore of iron option a hammerite option b magnetite option c siderite option d anglicite just think for 10 seconds and give the correct answer Here we go. The correct option is option D, anglicide, because anglicide is not an ore of iron, but it's an ore of lead. So, what are the other ores of iron and its composition? Uh, we have. Let's see that. Hammerite. Hammerite is having chemical formula Fe2O3, in which 70 percentage of iron can be extracted. Another 30 percentage are impurities that has to be dis discarded magnetite is denoted by fe3o4 and it has some more percentage like 75 percentage of iron in it limonite denoted by 2 feo3 fe2o3 3 has 2 o and it has 60 percentage of iron content in it iron pyrite denoted by fes2 it has 47 percentage of iron content in it iron means uh, Fe alone. So 47 percentage of iron content present in iron pyrite. In cedarite, that is FeCO3, has 40 percentage of iron content in it. So hammerite and magnetite leads the most in terms of uh, maximum percentage of iron content in these two ores, hammerite and magnetite. Now in this question. A, B, C are correct, that is A, B, C are uh, ores of iron, but D, anglicide, is not an ore of iron, but it's an ore of lead. Now let's move on to second question. Second question, pig iron contains. Pig iron uh, contains uh, what, what are the chemical compositions from which we have to identify the correct option. Option A, 3 to 4 percentage of carbon. Option B, 7 percentage of silicon. Option C 0 percentage manganese. Option D 3 percentage sulfur. Though the pig iron contains carbon, silicon, manganese, sulfur, but how much percentage it contains varies. From these four options, which is the correct percentage and corresponding composition, corresponding chemical component. Your time starts now. So the correct option is option A that is pig iron contains 3 to 4 percentage of carbon. Then what about silicon percentage, manganese percentage and sulfur percentage. Let's see now. Silicon in pig iron silicon content is about 0.5 to 3.5 percentage. Manganese content 0.5 to 2 percentage. Sulfur varies from 0.02 to 0.1 percentage. Phosphorus varies from 0.03 to 1 percentage. Sulfur and phosphorus are somewhat undesirable uh, for uh, structural steel. So pig iron uh, contains uh, sulfur and phosphorus in a very meager amounts and silicon has 0.5 to 3.5, manganese 0.5 to 2 percentage and carbon 3 to 4 percentage. Now let's move on to third question. Which are the following statements? Is or are correct? regarding steel and cast iron see there are diff some differences between steel and cast iron what are the differences let's see in the options and give the correct answer cast iron is plastic and forgeable steel is plastic and forgeable cast iron is neither plastic nor forgeable option both b and c that is 
uh, steel is plastic and forgeable as well as cast iron is neither plastic nor forgeable which is the correct option so the answer is option d that is both b and c that is steel is plastic and forgeable cast iron is neither plastic nor forgeable that means cast iron is very brittle in nature we cannot uh, uh, deform like a plastic uh, manner and it cannot be forgeable too now let's say some more notes regarding this cast iron is hard and brittle but cast iron is strong in compression but it is weak in tension and shear and it cannot be magnetized cast iron cannot be magnetized but steel can be magnetized in cast iron carbon content is very very higher so carbon whenever carbon content is higher than usual then we can say that that uh, iron iron made component is hard and brittle and it is strong in compression but weak in tension and shear so in case of steel we have somewhat low carbon content uh, comparable to cast iron that's why steel is plastic as well as forgeable now let's move on to fourth question plain mild steel is more ductile than hysd that is high elastic deformed bars and absorbs shocks better is this statement true or false just think for 10 seconds and guess the correct option true or false plain mild steel is more ductile or not compared to hysd yes this statement is true now let's see some more points about this mild steel is also known as low carbon steel having 0.1 percentage to 0.25 percentage of carbon see uh, whenever there is a low carbon content then that iron a uh, made component will be ductile in nature and also absorbs shocks better hysd means it is nothing but fe415 or fe500 or fe550 what it represents 415 means 415 newton per mm square strength of that hysd bars uh, similarly fe500 and fe550 comparing to these two uh, bars plain ms rod has more ductility and it also absorbs shocks better now let's move on to fifth question manganese steel is used in there are various alloys of steel nickel manganese invar steel and so on so manganese every alloy of steel has its own purposes and uses now let's see the use of manganese steel whether it is used in automobile parts whether it is used in gears and shafts whether it is used in uh, railway points and crossings or utensils your time starts now manganese is used manganese steel is used in points and crossings of railways so how about uh, automobile parts gear shafts and other utensils are made of manganese steel is hard tough strong that's why it is used in points and crossings because in during in points and crossings various uh, rails will various trains will cross and heavy loads will be concentrated The, so we have to use hard tough and strong steel kind of steel that is manganese steel and it has also a high electrical resistance so what are the other purposes of manganese steel milling equipment crusher jar rollers etc and automobile parts are uh, made of vanadium and nickel steels these are some other alloys of steel and gears axles shafts these are made of molybdenum alloy steel so so 
so manganese steel is used in railway points and crossings and others are some milling equipments etc vanadium nickel are used in automobile parts molybdenum is used in gears shafts axles now let's move on to the sixth question the purest form of iron is see there are various forms of iron uh, in the previous uh, one of the questions we have seen like pig iron so like that very uh, there are many forms of iron what is the purest form of iron from those option a pig iron option b wrought iron option c steel option d cast iron so what is the purest form of iron The purest form of iron is wrought iron because uh, when it comes to purity it means that uh, various kinds of impurities like sulfur, phosphorus and what else uh, sulfur, phosphorus and manganese etc are removed so that we get the purest form of iron that is Fe. So uh, when we get like that we call it as wrought iron and what are the other important properties and with respect to cast iron, pig iron, etc. So by removing impurities from cast iron, we get wrought iron. That's what I said. By removing impurities, impurities mean what else? Sulfur, phosphorus, manganese, silicon, like those things. If you re remove those uh, other components, we get the purest form. So total impurities are limited to only 0.5 percentage. That is 99.5 percentage of the component will be Fe only. Only 0.5 percentage in wrought iron will can be a impurity. So how it is uh, compound? Uh, how it is uh, compounded? C C C has that is carbon is around 0.15 percentage. In that 0.5 percentage of impurities, silicon 0.15, phosphorus 0.13, sulfur 0.03 only, manganese 0.05 percentage. So clubbing together the, together all these impurities we get 0.5 percentage or less than that uh, in a wrought iron. So what are the uses of wrought iron where we can use? Used in fences, gates, railings, porches, canopies, or shelter, grills, hardware, nails etc. We can use wrought iron that is the purest form of iron in these uh, places. Now let's move on to seventh question. Seventh question is tool steel is the one which has carbon content. Option A more than one percentage of carbon content. Option B more than two percentage. Option C less than 0.5 percentage. Option D no carbon content that is zero percentage. Tool steel contains carbon content of more than one percentage. Whenever a steel contains carbon content more than one percentage, we can use that uh, iron made steel as a tool component. So what are the other properties a tool steel must have? A tool steel has to be has to uh, be uh, expected to be distinctive hardness, resistance to abrasion and deformation. So these are some kind of properties a tool steel must possess. It is a carbon alloy steel because carbon is uh, carbon content is more than one percentage. So we can call this tool steel as carbon alloy steel. And what are the various types of tool tool steel in the market? We have water hardening tool steel, air hardening, D type, oil hardening, shock resisting types, hard working. These are some of the uh, types of tool steel. Uh, we can uh, find in the market. Now let's move on to eighth question. Let's see the eighth question, which is a dental term applied for heating and slow cooling of metal or any other material which has developed strain due to rapid cooling. So there are some uh, kinds of heat treatments that we will apply for steel in order to get or develop desired properties. So the properties of steel can be controlled and changed by various heat treatment processes. 
so what are what is that process in which um, after heating uh, strain will be developed due to rapid cooling option a hardening option b normalizing option c annealing option d tempering these four are uh, some of the heat treatment processes uh, to get the desired properties and for this property what is the heat treatment process So the option is option C annealing. So annealing is the general term applied for heating and slow cooling of metal which has developed strain due to rapid cooling. So in annealing uh, it is uh, the steel is heated below a critical temperature critical temperature such that uh, strain recrystallization occurs and then cooled it down. So that is known as the uh, strain due to rapid cooling and let's see some more points regarding this annealing is done at 500 to 600 degrees celsius it also imparts softness ductility and malleability it also removes gases removes strain that that is the main thing we have we are using the annealing heat treatment so developed strain due to rapid cooling it means in a single term we can say strain recrystallization so strain recrystallization happens when annealing heat treatment process is done so what about the other treatment methods like hardening uh, normalizing tempering hardening is, is nothing but steel is heated above the upper critical temperature uh, holding it uh, that temperature for some time and then quenching it rapidly to produce a uh, some martensite structure so this is the hardening uh, process a hardened steel will be somewhat highly brittle and cannot be used for practical applications and what is normalizing normalizing uh, in normalizing steel is heated above critical range and cooling down rapidly in air but at a rate slower than a critical cooling rate so only in annealing process steel is heated below the critical temperature and in hardening and normalizing steel is heated above the critical temperature the normalizing uh, heat treatment refines the grain structure also uh, resulting from like uh, mechanical uh, things like rolling forcing and other manufacturing processes and what is tempering uh, it is like hardened plain carbon steel is in its metastable condition or we can say this at equilibrium so this uh, hardened steel is reheated at temperature below the critical temperature here also the temperature uh, will be below the critical temperature as annealing uh, so which gives the steel in stable condition tempering uh, temperature uh, varies from like 100 to 700 degrees celsius as like more or like uh, annealing temperature so higher the temperature of tempering process softer is the resulting steel so resulting steel will be softer if uh, temperature in tempering process will be higher these are about the heat treatment given to steel manufacturing now let's move on to ninth one atomic number of iron is dash and it occurs in how many allotropic forms your options are 24 5 26 4 that is atomic number of ion is 26 uh, allotropic forms number of allotropic forms 4 or atomic number 28 or under 3 allotropic forms atomic number 26 5 allotropic forms what is the correct uh, number Correct option is option B. Iron atomic number is 26 and it occurs in four allotropic forms. Now let's see some more important points. What are those allotropic forms are denoted? Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Alpha iron, iron is weak and ductile. 
and it's also magnetic in nature and it has a crystal structure like body centered cubic so what is body centered cubic here you can visualize here this is the body centered cubic structure uh, in which the alpha ion is possessing beta ion is brittle hard and non-magnetic it is unlike alpha ion alpha ion is magnetic beta ion is non-magnetic alpha ion is ductile beta ion is brittle beta ion dissolves carbon but alpha ion does not so there are uh, uh, distinctive differences between alpha and beta ion gamma ion is similar to beta only but only thing is the crystal structure is fcc space centered cubic uh, structure gamma iron is possessing this is the face centered cubic this is the bcc one delta ion is non magnetic gamma ion containing carbon we call those ions as austenitic whereas alpha ion containing carbon we call those as ferritic so these are some uh, important points regarding the allotropic forms of uh, ion that is ferrous metal allotropic forms are nothing but alpha beta gamma delta alpha ion is weak and weak and ductile magnetic bcc so we conductile means uh, in mild steel alpha iron is there we can infer like that beta ion is brittle hard non-magnetic dissolves carbon so in cast iron we can find the beta ion content more gamma ion is similar to beta only but face centered cubic structure delta ion is non-magnetic gamma ion is gamma ion containing carbon we can call this as austenitic alpha ion ferritic now let's move on to 10th one which of the following is used as flux in pig iron to remove sulfur as etc so we are adding some chemical component like flux in order to remove impurities like sulfur as etc option a sand option b borax option c fluorite option d limestone so what is flux we are using in pig iron in order to remove impurities like sulfur as etc so the flux is limestone limestone is used or it is added as flux to remove sulfur ash etc now let's see some more important points limestone combines with the fuel ashes and impurities in the iron ore so combines mean what combines means what it uh, removes the impurities to form a uh, fusible products so that uh, it will separate out that is impurities will get separated out as a slag so that's why we are using limestone as a flux in pig iron now let's move on to 11th one anti corrosion properties for st structural steel provided by so in a steel there are many components or many uh, major metals uh, so that every component has some properties so now anti corrosion properties are provided by either nickel chromium molybdenum or columbium chromium copper or phosphorus sulfur or aluminium and silicon so what is the correct option that will give the what is the correct uh, components that will uh, provide anti corrosion properties so the anti corrosion properties are provided by columbium chromium copper so triple c corrosion c so columbium chromium copper these are the ones which will uh, provide anti corrosion so what are the other things uh, has the uses nickel nickel is responsible for fracture toughness strength at low temperature meaning at a low temperature like uh, at low room temperature or less than that nickel will be responsible for uh, strength property giving strength to the steel 
MO means molybdenum. Molybdenum will be responsible for strength at higher temperature. Other things like manganese, nickel, vanadium. So these three things together will provide uh, resistance for impact loads. So if these three are uh, present in a steel, then impact loads can be uh, resisted. Phosphorus and sulfur are always undesirable one. It will enhance the internal segregation. Phosphorus and sulfur are always undesirable. Internal segregation of components will happen due to this. So, columbium, chromium, copper will provide anti corrosion properties. Nickel will provide fracture toughness, strength at low temperature, molybdenum, strength at higher temperature, and manganese, nickel, vanadium will provide strength during impact loads. Now, let's move on to 12th one. Which of the following is not a process of manufacture of steel? There are some various uh, types of processes which will uh, be used to uh, manufacture steel. Option A, bessemer process. Option B, cementation. Option C, duplex process. Option D, serration process. So, which of the following is not a process of manufacture of steel? So, uh, three of them are, uh, are the process of ma manufacture of steel and one is not. Which one is that? find it so the option is option D that is serration serration is not a process of manufacture of steel other three things like bessemer cementation duplex these are some of the processes of manufacture of steel now let's see some more important points regarding that. Bessemer process means removal of impurities from the iron by oxidation with air being blown through the molten iron. So whichever is the process, same is the uh, ultimate principle that, that is nothing but removal of impurities. How we are uh, removing the impurities matters in uh, every process. In Bessemer, it, uh, impurities are removed from the iron by oxidation. So oxidation is done uh, through the molten iron. In cementation, carburization of iron is done so that impurities will be removed. Duplex means uh, it uses both the principles of Bessemer and cementation process. So it is a two-step procedure. So other uh, processes are open hearth, crucible steel, lins, donavits. These are some other uh, processes of manufacture of steel. So we can uh, see this later. So these are the process of manufacture of steel. That is one of one is bessemer, cementation, duplex, open hearth, crucible steel, and lens donavits. Now let's move on to thirteenth one. Proper representation of ISF steel flats is. So uh, how we are representing the steel flats as per IS code uh, if we if it comes to uh, I beam we are representing IS 450 like 450 is nothing but the depth of the uh, beam so likewise what is the proper representation of uh, Indian standard steel flats option A X IS Y that is where uh, X is the width of the flat and Y is the thickness in case of flat we will have a width and thickness Option B, IS, X hyphen Y. Option C, only the thickness, ISY. Option D, first thickness and then width. What is the current representation? So the correct option is option A, that is X, IS, Y. So, for example, uh, width of IS flat is some like 20 mm and thickness is somewhat like 5 mm when we will represent those as 20 IS 5. So, it means 20 mm width, 5 mm thickness. So, this is the proper representation of steel flats. There are 9 grades as per IS 5986. 
these are uh, based on the carbon content and some other strength properties 165 205 235 etc up to 560 we have nine grades of is steel flats uh, also the tubes and uh, pipes so this we can find in is code 5986 now let's move on to 14th question carbon equivalent is given by so carbon equivalent uh, is given by some formula based on the uh, is code and ladle analysis what is that formula c plus mn that is manganese by one sixth of manganese plus sum of chromium molybdenum vanadium uh, divided by 5 plus nickel plus copper divided by 15 or option b or option c or option d what is the correct a formula that we will use to calculate carbon equivalent first of all what is carbon equivalent whenever all these materials together will have one property that property will be uh, resultant uh, that the properties resultant will be given by the one carbon molecule or the carbon equivalent uh, molecule so that's why we are calculating the carbon equivalent uh, one so what is the correct formula <laughs> option a is the correct one carbon equivalent is given by uh, c plus m1 by c 6 plus chromium plus molybdenum plus uh, v by 5 plus nickel plus copper by 15 so let's see the uh, analysis what is the ladle analysis that we are preferring to uh, derive this carbon equivalent formula what is the ladle analysis when metal is me melted in a foundry for pouring into molds of casting so metal is melted in a foundry we need to be sure that end casting product will have desired chemical composition so whenever a metal or the iron ore is melted and in a foundry for pouring into molds we have to ensure the desired chemical composition so what to so how can we uh, ensure so a little melt is taken by way of collecting it in a ladle and sent to lab for its chemical analysis so in a uh, ladle we will take one sample and that sample is, will be uh, sent to lab for chemical analysis what are the compositions present in it so once this test confirms its composition correct pouring the metal in all the molds will be continued so this is called as the ladle analysis this is very simple as we are doing in a concrete testing like uh, we will test some three uh, cubes and average of those compressive strength of those three cubes we will get to know that this concrete has this much strength that is like m35 m30 like that so the same way we are doing in, in a test in a ladle analysis so that we will uh, get to know about the carbon equivalent uh, in uh, by using chemical analysis now let's move on to 15th question rolled steel tubes are referred by their so there are some differences between tubes and pipes you can uh, learn those differences in this uh, link uh, that is provided in this uh, description I will share those links in the description you can learn about this rolled steel tubes how are how these are referred option a inner diameters option b outer outer radius option c outer diameters option d thickness so how rolled steel tubes are referred So the correct option is option C outer dia. So rolled steel tubes are referred by their outer diameters. And what about the pipes? And what are the some more important points we have to be aware of? Tube is represented by outer dia, but pipe is represented by inner dia. So wall thickness of a pipe is referred to as a pipe scheduled thickness. So in in order to get the uh, a referral of pipe 
we will get the we, have, we will use a wall thickness as pipe schedule thickness for example sch80 this is one of the hardest uh, pipe we will get tube can be square or rectangle too but pipe cannot be square or rectangle pipe has to be uh, uh, round only right tube can be square or rectangle so rolled steel tubes are referred by outer diameters but pipe is referred by inner diameters or inner dimension we can say pipe is referred by inner di dimension tube is referred by outer dimension and tube can be square or rectangle too it, in case of rectangle what is the outer dimension that is nothing but the perimeter outer perimeter uh, same as the square square means 4 times the side rectangle means 2 into L plus B so outer dimension we will uh, refer for to represent to represent rolled steel tubes now let's see the 16th question which of the following is known as hard steel option a high tensile steel option b high carbon steel option c mild steel option c hardened steel so among these four options which of the following which of, which of these is known as hard steel So hard steel, uh, high carbon steel is also known as hard steel. But why? Let's see the properties. High carbon steel is tougher and more elastic than MS. So high carbon steel, that, that is nothing but hard steel is more tougher. And it is difficult to forge and weld. Because of high carbon content, it will be brittle in nature. So uh, while welding, it will become uh, broken so that's why it is difficult to forge and weld carbon content will be around 0.55 to 1.5 percentage so it can be used as a tool steel we can uh, we have uh, already seen in a pre one of the previous questions uh, whenever carbon content is more than one percentage we can use that steel as tool steel high tensile steel uh, is nothing but a medium carbon steel because uh, whenever we have to possess some we have to uh, get tensile strength in a steel we have to reduce carbon content so high tensile steel is also known as medium carbon steel high carbon steel has is also known as hard steel and it cannot be forged or weld and it is also tougher and more elastic than ms more elastic means it has more uh, strength yield strength but deformation is very very less it will break as soon as uh, strain reaches some value but mild steel has more strain value or strain hardening property but high carbon steel that is hard steel has very very less strain hardening property now let's see the 17th question poisson's ratio of structural steel in elastic range and plastic range respectively is what is poisson's ratio is nothing but the ratio of uh, lateral strain to longitudinal strain option a 0.5 and 0.5 that is a both elastic range and plastic range Poisson ratio ratio do not vary which is nothing but 0.5 or 0.3 and 0.5 that is 0.3 for elastic range and 0.5 for plastic range or obviously it is opposite like 0.5 and 0.3 or both are 0.3 which is the correct option So the option is option B 0 0.3 and 0 0.5 that is Poisson's ratio varies in elastic range as well as in plastic range in elastic range it is around 0.3 and in plastic range it will be 0 0.5 as per IS 800 uh, it is given as 0 0.3 as for elastic range and 0 0.5 for plastic range so Poisson's ratio what what it measure measures the deformation in the material in a direction perpendicular to the direction of applied force that is nothing but the lateral strain to the uh, axial strain and in negative 
because minus uh, y minus because uh, one of the dimensions will be shrinking or contracting and other dimension will be expanding that's why minus uh, lateral strain divided by longitudinal strain is a Poisson's ratio and it differs in elastic range and plastic range uh, we will consider only the elastic range in the calculation of uh, structural steel design because we are uh, supposed to use only uh, calculation in within the elastic range not the plastic range so that's why new is adopted as 0.3 for steel design calculations now let's move on to 18th question according to is 808 depth of an eye section shall not exit so that there is no need of any type of stiffeners so uh, if it comes to depth of an eye section means a hard rolled eye section not a plate girder or something like that it is a hard rolled eye beam uh, so that uh, there is no need of type of stiffness what is the maximum depth option a 500 mm option b 650 option c 600 option d 450 mm what is the maximum depth so that there is uh, no need of type of stiffness Option C is the right option that is the maximum depth of an eye section is 600 mm uh, so that there will be no need of any type of stiffener. Let's see some other notes. IS-808 uh, gives the dimensions of hard rolled steel beam column channel as well as the angle sections and hard rolled medium and high tensile structural steel is uh, given in I IS code 2062. We can refer these to IS code to get the uh, dimensions of hard rolled and as well as the hard rolled medium and high tensile structural steel. So in this question 600 mm is the uh, maximum depth uh, so that no stiffness will be needed for a rolled hard rolled eye section. Now let's move on to 19th question. The gauge length of MS rod for tensile strength as per IS 1608 is taken as so this is the gauge length you can see in the diagram this is the gauge length the, what is this length we have to use in order to test the tensile uh, strength so this is the grip one this is the grip uh, part uh, we have we are supposed to fit in a, a machine and we have to test the tension so gauge length shall be uh, what is that option a 5.65 root s naught s naught is nothing but the structure sorry a uh, cross sectional area so this is the cross sectional area uh, s naught is will be denoted in mm square so 5.65 root s naught or 6.65 root s naught or 6.55 root s naught or 5.95 root s naught which is the correct option as per IS-1608 the gauge length is taken as option A 5.65 root S0 so this is the standard uh, gauge length we have to calculate for a tensile strength of a MS rod as per IS 1608 the original gauge length shall not be less than 20 mm so whichever is the case the gauge length cannot be less than shall not be less than 20 mm though uh, by calculating by this formula if we get some gauge length as uh, 16 mm or 17 mm we cannot adopt that so because gauge length cannot be less than 20 mm and force is applied as axially as possible so uh, we have to we have to ensure that uh, axial load is applied in a tensile strength test in a UTM machine so option is a 5.65 root s naught is the gauge length of MS rod for tensile ten, tensile strength test now let's move on to 20th question as carbon content increases 
what is the effect stent decreases and ductility increases or stent increases but ductility decreases or stent decreases and ductility remains the same ductility is not affected by carbon content or both are both strength and ductility increases what is the third option so carbon content increases will have an effect on strength and ductility in such a manner that strength will increase but ductility decreases we have already seen this concept in the previous question uh, high carbon steel is highly brittle and it has more compressive strength but has lesser toughness property lesser toughness property means lesser ductility so strength has increased but ductility decreased High, higher carbon content reduces weldability also and it also lowers the melting point and it and the steel art can be uh, prone to corrosion so high carbon content will have many effects only one advantage is strength increases other things like ductility decreases uh, weldability also reduces because toughness is reduced uh, so that's why weldability also reduced and it also lowers the melting point and the steel becomes corrosive now let's move on to 21 stresses that remain in structural members after rolling or fabrication are known as so for example uh, let's take i beam hot rolled i beam after uh, rolling in in a hot roll uh, it is cooled so when it is hot when it is heated and then cooled there will be some stresses what is that stress named whether it is called longitudinal stress or it can be called as fatigue stress or it can be called as residual stress or it can be called as the maximum stress that is reached what is the name we will give for this one So the option is option C that is residual stress is the stress that remaining structural members after rolling or fabrication. In a hard rolled structural shape, the residual stresses result from unequal cooling rates after rolling. So uh, for, for example, if we take high rolled high beam, hard rolled high beam, unequal cooling rates happen. That's why residual stresses will be taken care of while uh, consider as considering these beam in calculation in a welded member tensile residual stresses developed near the weld and compressive stresses elsewhere provide equilibrium so in a welded member means tensile re residual stresses will be tensile so that will be compensated by compressive stresses which is produced elsewhere so that equilibrium will be attained so this is the concept of residual stresses this diagram represents, represents the uh, residual stresses, how the residual stresses are concentrated. This is for example a welded box section, how residual stresses are concentrated. We can uh, visualize like this. Now let's move on to 22. Cementite is a. So there are some of the forms of iron uh, like we have seen in uh, allotropic forms like alpha beta gamma delta like that there are from some forms of iron like cementite austen austenite uh, ferrite etc pearlite uh, some more uh, forms of iron are there in this what is the cementite whether it is a cementitious material formed in iron compound or it is a mixture of iron and cement or it is a compound of iron and carbon or uh, none of these uh, this is some other thing we have to be care of what is the correct option so the correct option is option c compound of iron and carbon so cementite can be called as a 
compound of iron and carbon. So what are the other things have to be aware of? Carbide. Iron carbide is nothing but the cementite and it is generated by Fe3C. Cementite contains 93.3% of iron and around 6.7% of carbon. It has orthorhombic crystal structure and other uh, forms of iron are pearlite, austenite, bionite, martensite, etc. So you can refer this uh, graph so that we can get to know what is austenite, cementite, etc. according to the temperature. So according to the temperature and the weight of uh, percentage of carbon, we can denote uh, iron as ferrite, cementite, alpha, gamma, austenite, etc. We can refer this graph to differentiate the iron compounds. Now let's move on to 23rd question. Drilling is preferable to punching because so drilling is different from punching. You can see in this diagram this this is the punching machine punching tool. This is a drilling machine. So what is the difference and why drilling is most preferable uh, to punching option A punching drastically cold works the material at the edge of the hole. What is cold working cold working means at uh, permanent deformation that we are creating so that a desirable uh, thing will be achieved like uh, for example bolt hole option B hole size is restricted uh, because in punching hole size is restricted or not let's see the option option C punching is not precise option D punching requires additional labor cost so what is the correct option that fits the question that is drilling is preferable to punching because option is a that is because punching drastically cold works the material at the edge of a hole so that's why drilling is most preferable. Punching makes the steel less ductile and rises the transition temperature, but drilling does not. Punching can produce short cracks, extending that crack will be extended radially. For example, uh, if we punching uh, here, the crack formed like here. So that crack will get ex uh, radially extended to the other steel parts also. So that's why punching is not preferred while drilling this whole part this hole will be removed as like this but in punching it cannot be removed it just cold out and punching will uh, enhance the brittle failure so that's why punching is not preferred drilling is preferred to make a bolt hole or something like that now let's move on to 24th question Which of the following is or are well defects? So there are some of the well defects. You can see, uh, you can refer this diagram for getting the welding defects. Option A, porosity. Option B, slag inclusion. Option C, hot tear. Option D, all of the above. So uh, some of the well defects can be uh, visualized here. So what is that well defect or uh, all those all a b c are correct one your option is so the correct option is option d all of the above because porosity is also a type of well defect slag inclusion hot tear and and there are other uh, well defects we will see now Undercut makes imperfection uh, decreases cross sectional energy. Undercut undercut means this is the a type of undercut. This one and this one. This is a type of undercut. So undercut re results imperfection. You can uh, zoom it here and see the imperfection uh, that is happening. Or you can uh, click this link uh, so that you can get the uh, get a visualization on welding defects. 
porosity is a result of weld metal contamination so whenever uh, metal gets contaminated then porosity will happen Por porosity means uh, a dot dot like structure within the weld porous um, material will be there incomplete fusion means gap inside the joint that is not filled so uh, it is self explanatory uh, incomplete fusion spatters means what is spatters spatters is nothing but uh, this this is the one it is the spatters that is uh, if if you are welding two plates and that weld metal will get spattered out in the other parts of the metal and will get settled so that is the spatters this is nothing but the tiny metal particles that are ejected from the arc and this occurs mainly in the gas metal arc welding there are different types of welding in which gas metal arc welding uh, has a defect called spatters so these are some of the weld defects now let's move on to the last one 25th question unit mass of steel is a basic and important question which is asked in various examinations repetitively option a 7550 kilogram per meter cube option b 7850 kilogram per meter cube option c 7580 meter kilogram per meter cube option c option d 7880 kilogram per meter cube so which is the correct unit mass of steel so the correct option is option b that is unit mass of steel is uh, nothing but 7850 kilogram per meter cube now let's see some more important points regarding structural steel Young's modulus of a structural steel is equal to 2 into 10 power 5 newton per mm square modulus of rigidity g is equal to 0.769 into 10 power 5 newton per mm square coefficient of thermal expansion that is alpha is equal to 12 into 10 power minus 6 per degree celsius and in case of steel rod that is a reinforcement steel rod we can calculate weight of those steel rod in by using this formula d square by 162 d square is nothing but the diameter in mm so d square divided by 162 gives the uh, kilogram per meter run if we have a steel a steel rod of like 40 uh, feet we have to multiply uh, that length to get the whole weight in kilogram so per meter run uh, the weight of steel rod can be calculated by using this formula that is d squared by 162 where d in mm that is diameter of steel rod used in uh, millimeters so this is the last question we are at the end of this video uh, let's see another uh, some other uh, notes in other video. Thank you.